Good morning, everyone. Welcome to panel two of the IPS Singapore Perspectives Conference on Work. We have heard this morning from Minister Chan Chun Singh, who spoke about changes that's happening in the macro as well as the domestic environment and the five key thrusts and shifts that he said that the Singapore education system should make. So set against this context, this panel focuses on transitioning to the digital, green and care economies and how to succeed in the jobs ahead. Now the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about many changes to the way we live, interact and work. What has become obvious, perhaps painfully obvious to many people, is that digital skills, particularly those of high transferability, are becoming increasingly essential for workers of different levels in different sectors. Now, for example, in the green economy, as companies adopt more environmentally sustainable practices and try and develop sustainability targets for compliance and reporting, many jobs require green skills. And in the care sector, jobs and the corresponding skills that are required are also undergoing transformation due to the growing preponderance in preventive care, transformative human resource, and of course, mental well-being. So today, together with my panelists, we tackle head on what and where new jobs are likely to be in the digital care and green economies, and more importantly, what Singaporeans would need to succeed in their new roles. We will also address what skills and attributes Singaporeans would require besides hard skills, not just to merely survive, but thrive in the three economies. Now, this event is open for media coverage, and we are joined this morning by three trailblazers from various sectors. So our first panelist is Ms. Winnie Tan. She is Senior Vice President for Sustainability at Great Eastern, where she leads a newly created corporate team that focuses on helping the business grow responsibly. She steers the organization's navigation in environmental, social and governance risks and opportunities while achieving its green and social impact goals. Our second panelist is Dr. Ong Cheng Hui, who has spent more than 20 years in R&D and technology innovation. Now, Dr. Ong is Assistant Chief Executive of the Business and Technology Group at IMDA, where she oversees IMDA's efforts in developing the industry and research ecosystem around emerging technologies. Dr. Ong is also the woman behind IMDA's Future Communications R&D program to support 6G research and the AI Verify Toolkit for AI Governance. Our third panelist is Dr. Ng Wai Chong, founder and chief executive of NWC Longevity Practice, a startup providing aged care consultancy, training and research, and direct clinical services. Dr. Ng has worked as a community aged care physician for more than 20 years and is recognized as a thought leader in healthy aging. For more, on, for more information on our panelists' stellar records, do refer to your conference kit. So this is how we will run the panel. Our panelists will take about 15 minutes each to share their perspectives on the topic, following which we will open the session to a discussion with everyone online. We invite you to share your comments and questions anytime during the panel session, you can do so by using the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. Do contribute to the discussion in a respectful manner. And without further delay, let me invite Ms. Winnie Tan to share her remarks. Winnie, over to you, please. Thank you, Carol, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Winnie Tan from Great Eastern. We're a Singapore-based insurance company. Um, we operate in the Southeast Asia region and listed in Singapore Exchange. Uh, we cover both general and life insurance and serving both retail and corporate customers. So today's topic is clearly um, resonating both to, resonating to me at both a professional and personal level. Clearly, if you look at my job title and what I do at work, um, thinking about the green economy and more importantly, how we work in the company, thinking about what we stand for, thinking about how we ensure profitability, how we meet the demands of our stakeholders, investors, shareholders, employees, etc. This is what we do um, sort of every day in, in my day job. But what happens is at a personal level, um, thinking about how to succeed in the jobs ahead. 
that is clearly something that we have sort of evolved and learned along the way because when I graduated, there was no such thing as a certificate of sustainability or a Bachelor of Arts in, in that. So it was something that you picked up along the way. And when you started in the workforce at the time when I did, um, sustainability was not quite the common business language or in the lingo that we have. Um, it's clearly important uh, because we keep hearing it and all its related words today. And that is a wonderful thing, assuming that we know what's the difference between green and greenwashing. So, but this is why it's important because climate change actually would touch lives and livelihoods. So that is, I think, establishing the context and the importance of it. But maybe what we might want to do is also establish a common understanding about what green economy really means. So if we look at the definition from the United uh, Nations Environment Programme, this is how they define it. A green economy is one that results in improved human well-being and social equity while significantly reducing environment risks and ecological scarcities. So if you break it down very quickly, um, I think two of the biggest things that come out is the green economy is not just about the environment or the ecology. It's about the social impact of climate change and the concept of social equity making sure that no one is left behind. And clearly from an insurer's perspective, I'm going to throw in two other points that's really important as well. The health and the quality of lives that we lead, okay, uh, given the physical impact of climate change and all the interrelated dependencies that result of that. And number two, what would be the economic impact of the transition to the green economy? We all know the urgency of reducing our carbon emissions, meeting a 2030 goal. 2030 is really not that far away. It's seven years away. How fast can we get there and at what cost? And are you on the train or is it going to leave without you? And what would you need as a skill set for individuals um, in, in order to make sure that you are on pace with the changes that happens? And, and what are some of the larger policies and ecosystem changes that will happen that policymakers can think about um, management board directors in companies can think about all of that. It is that sort of um, ecosystem play where all, all members and actors have a role to play to sort of move this forward, which makes this important, but incredibly difficult to execute well. And obviously, if you think about green economy, I think the second thing that's very, very important is the concept of growth. We are not talking about thinking about the environment at the cost of social or economic development. In fact, what we are thinking about is how might we achieve economic development and social uh, uh, development while cutting down social uh, cutting down our carbon emissions while thinking about the cost of carbon tax in our balance sheet, right? Uh, while thinking about diversity and factoring factoring in in the cost of production, and how does it affect our supply chain? So I think businesses will think about that, but also then I think we will need to also think about. How do we become more resource efficient? How do we use technology and innovation? Um, where are we going to find people who know how to do these things? And again, I'm, I'm going to say this quite often. How do policies um, and regulation uh, kick in in the right pace and at the right time so that it can shape behavior at scale, so that it can induce and catalyze government spending that will pave the way for the changes that will happen? And how do we also do it when the starting line is different for everyone? So with this, let's talk a little bit about what a transition to a green economy would look like and what does this mean to the future of work? So, so for me personally, I always see a very strong similarity between uh, the pandemic um, and this whole transition for, for, for the green economy and the fight against climate change. Uh, several lessons there, but one of it is, is very clear. Um, for the pandemic, you're not safe till everyone is safe. And I think from a, for the issue about climate change is the Paris Agreement would not be successful if only a few countries sign up to it or only if a few countries met their national targets. Uh, what we really need is support and change at scale because when it, well, when it rains, it literally rains on everyone. And I'm saying this metaphorically. So we know that it, climate change will happen in increasing severity and frequency and we know that the impact is going to be unequal because some countries are going to be able to cope with it slightly better. Uh, some segments of the industry will transit a little bit more naturally. Um, but, but this is where we realize this is how far reaching it is. Um, the transition to the green economy will affect virtually all industries and literally everyone. It's just a matter of time and how much. And, and how do I, how do I, what do I really mean by that? 
So if you think about carbon intensive sectors or industries, um, think about your maritime, your transport, aviation, cement, um, they will need to evolve. Uh, evolve to synchronize with demands for regulations, uh, demands for policy changes, demands from investors, right? Um, new green industries that are naturally um, um, uh, in this space, they would have sprung up. And it will create new jobs, but it will also take away some of the existing ones. So those industries and companies and people who can evolve would be the one who are innovative, nimble, and can learn and be resilient enough. And I think this is not um, a new trend. We see this very often in, for example, the digital transformation. We've seen this very long time ago when, when data centers started created, uh, started being set up, um, the hubbing process and all of that. So the process and the cycles are not unfamiliar, but the thing is, how do we manage that in the pace and scale at, in today's time? So my favorite example is always about the automobile industry. Thinking about Tesla, EV cars and the clean mobility industry for transport. So obviously Tesla has taken a very important first step. They have catalyzed a lot of change. They have secured a lot of sales, but clearly the conventional car makers are not sitting back and sort of waiting to see what happens. Everyone is jumping into the fight because there is a profitability and revenue piece. But very importantly, it's also about policies that have shaped it. Um, because a lot of countries have their national targets to meet for Paris Agreement, and the transition of the mobility industry into electrification is a very clear way to help them do that. Many governments are incentivizing um, the switch to electric vehicles. Um, you will see then changes in incentives, subsidies, pricing, uh, infrastructure bill, and all of that. This is where you see policies really shaping uh, mass adoption. Uh, shaping consumer behavior. This is very clear in Singapore. We see this progressively in a lot of other countries as well. Norway has a fantastic example of adoption and change. And there are many, many different ways of doing it. But imagine at a scale in 2020, 2035, which is just 12 years away, the European Union would ban the sale of all new ICE engine cars, the internal combustion engine vehicles. So when the EU bans new sales of the typical cars that we know today, we would expect EVs to make up a much larger part of the uh, economy and the user uh, and the consumer behavior. So what does this really mean for a traditional car maker employee? So you could be standing at the production line, um, you could be a sales executive in a company, or you could be a say a finance executive in 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 in, in a in an automobile industry. Um, so for a finance person, you may now have to think about reporting on your company's carbon emissions. You have to think about factoring in carbon taxes into your P&L and your financial reporting. Um, how might you acquire these skills? So naturally for this, um, you can see sort of different subsets. There are possibly brand new skills where retraining is really needed. And it could be very technical. It could be very uh, sophisticated. Um, but there's also a very large part, which is what I call the adjacency of skills. If you were a finance person who was already doing, say, financial reporting, um, um, having to factor carbon tax in there, that is a brand new category. And clearly, there's a lot of learning to be done, but it is not unusual. Same for as myself as a risk professional. When we think about climate risk, it is another category of risk on top of, say, um, um, liquidity management that we need to think about, um, capitalization, uh, we need about political risk, and et cetera. Yes, indeed, it is a brand new category and there's a lot of things that we need to know about it. But the logic after a while is not much different because it all dovetails into the whole risk management skill set. So I think this is where we need to think about how you acquire new skills um, and how you acquire knowledge. And obviously, businesses have a great role to play. And again, I'm going to say this, the right policies. Uh, policies for, for, for skills and learning and capacity building, it is going to enable... Um, resources to be made available to the masses or, or to enough the economy at the right pace and at the right time. Um, it's about creating an equal playing field, um, ensuring that we, we move fast enough. Um, I'm going to raise a topic that I actually don't have an answer for, which is, for example, the SMEs. Um, the SMEs make up 80-90% uh, uh, of our GDP. Uh, there's a huge dependency on them. 
Um, but the thing is, how do we then make sure that the change or the pace of change um, is the same for large corporates, medium corporates, MNCs, as well as local companies that we have? So I think there are many, many policies that we see now. Uh, we are seeing industry-level drug transformation uh, roadmaps. We are seeing, in particular, something that's focused on sustainable finance and green economy. So I think there are many ways of approaching the same issue. Um, again, it's about how do we make sure that the left hand talks to the right hand and when, when we have policies, they sort of synchronize and dovetail in the same direction. So, but if I could also add in a point about where the green economy is and why it's so dynamic. So if we think about Tesla, uh, and you also think about General Motors, which is a traditional car maker that has ventured out quite a bit in the space. Um, after a while, you realize that they don't just want to be car makers. Using the EV technology, the battery storage, and, and what and the know-how that they have, what they seem to become, they seem to be becoming renewable energy solutions provider. They could be giving maybe the traditional utility provider a run for the money. And, and where this is coming from is the green space is so dynamic in terms of the solutions. Technology has unlocked the pace and, and broadened the horizons. And, and in this case, it's worthy to keep watch on what happening as as uh, to what's happening, and it also means that if you are working in this space or in a subspace that's related to it, you need to think about where your skills might might evolve and and where you might need to brush up. So in that sense, the attitude and the approach is hugely important because it's about wanting to learn and wanting to excel. And I think in, in this way, the purpose of work is hugely important because the purpose of work looks different to everyone. Uh, in the post-pandemic or in the current pandemic situation, we talk about how we want to interact, how we want to work from home, how we want to balance a hybrid model. Um, but we also think about the purpose of work and the dignity of work, not just for a white um, caller executive who thinks about Zoom, virtual travel um, or, or virtual meeting and all of that. It's also about, say in an automobile example, the production line workers who go in and, and they play a role as, for example, the person who brings uh, the, the, the wages home, you know, because he or she has a family. And, and then there's the role that the person's played. And when the jobs look different, um, how might we help them to shape it so that they can perform their job at the level that is required? And because that's part of their identity, I bring the bacon home. I help to be part of that. I screw in the bolt for this particular part of the car but without which it wouldn't function. So I think we need to think about the purpose of work and the, the kind of approach from a sort of like all spectrums of, of jobs and sort of across levels and, and job functions. And obviously, uh, I'm going to also talk about technology and data because it sort of cuts across every industry and in the green economy journey, um, it is not an exception. So technology is a green enabler um, and also is financing. And then when it comes to financing, we always talk about data. How much do we know about it uh, so that we can evaluate risks? Uh, how much do we uh, uh, know about so that we can make the right financing decisions and, and fit into our risk modeling uh, 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 decisions? So data is a big topic, period, and it's also a key topic in this space of climate transition and, and sort of like green economy transition. So at this point, I wanted to point out that this nature of interrelatedness um, is, is very strong when you think about sustainability and when you think about green um, economy. So the way we see how digital and AI has transformed different industries across the board, they also hold a huge potential for catalyzing the change to the green economy. Because I'll give you some examples of how it works. Uh, standardizing data uh, so that we have an equal playing field and how might you uh, manage very, very large volumes of data? Uh, how might you, you use digitalization and use of AI in, in helping you to do that? Um, how do you harness the power of blockchain for supply chain management? Because when you green the manufacturing processes, you play a very big part in cutting down the carbon emissions. Um, how do you use blockchain because of the uniqueness of it to check for the provenance and quality of carbon credits that you're procuring? So I think the applications are, are almost endless. We may not have thought of all the possible applications at this point, but I think these are some of the very few possibilities. So in this process, we clearly need to find people who are able to do these things. And I've spoken a little bit about adjacency of roles and how you can learn to do your job better by acquiring additional skill sets around it. And I think... Um, um, the, the ideas about other ways of, of attaining, attaining um, talents are not new. 
attracting experienced talents, making making the country a great place to work, uh, building the pipeline of graduates and, and young workers, etc. Um, but I think what's really important is thinking about the fact that no one should be left behind in that process. Um, we should be thinking about the transition of the economy, not just for the white collar segment, but it's really about the everyday jobs. Uh, and, and that's the majority of them. Um, how might they pivot and how might they change and how do we then communicate the changes? Um, I, I used to work in a bank and digitalization has already hit the branches. Uh, the typical branch teller who has possibly had been at the job for, for a long time, our serve customer service representatives, um, the jobs have changed because there is the digitalization process. But the human touch is always something that's important. So how do we kind of build that in and make sure that it is part of our uh, mix, if you like? So I think they, these are thoughts that, that we have to think about as we think about the transition for a green economy, um, when we think about um, policies at, at, the, at a larger level, um, and we also think about the roles of companies and businesses. And obviously, I think the individual and, and their attitude and their willingness to learn, learn resilience. And, and with this, um, I'm going to, and this is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tan. Thank you so much for sharing with us your insights with regards to the kind of developments and trends that's happening in the green economy, um, particularly like your point about, you know, the key transitioning, the transitions that are happening and the implications on the future of work, right? You pointed out clearly uh, two key sets of um, skills, the brand new ones, as well as the adjacent skills, underscoring the importance of both, right? So we're talking about not just new skills acquisition, but also the acquisition of perhaps more expensive or even deeper knowledge. Um, I particularly appreciate your emphasis on not just, um, I think, the role of individuals in this entire transition, but also the role of businesses as well as um, the role of policy. Uh, and I think these are some of the key points that the minister emphasized during his um, keynote remarks this morning as well. Um, so you raised questions which you said you had no answers for yet, you know, on, for instance, the impact on SMEs and what can we do to uplift them. Hopefully, this is something that we can take up in the discussion together with the other two panelists as well as our audience online. So with that, um, I'd like to hand over the time to Dr. Ong from uh, Assistant CE at IMDA. Dr. Ong, please. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Chen Hui from IMDA. So we are a government agency that regulates digital technologies and media, develops the industry as well as supports social policies. Uh, my work uh, has focus on growing the research uh, industry as well as the uh, industry adoption of digital technologies. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about technology. Now technology permeates many parts of our daily lives. Uh, most of us own a handphone. There is a joke that says that people can go three weeks without food, three days without water, or only three minutes without internet. So I'm certain that some of our guests are actually looking at their phones right now as we speak. <laughs> Besides the phone, uh, we're also in constant interactions with artificial intelligence or AI. We use AI-based facial recognition to log into our phones and AI-based keyboards to predict our next words as we, that we will use as we type out our messages and our posts. Now, when we apply for jobs, our resumes now are likely to be first screened by applicant tracking systems or ATS that help companies track the whole HR hiring process. And these technologies will filter out the resumes that best match the job description. Now, doctors are also using AI to help detect diseases. AI systems like Selena Plus are helping doctors detect potentially threatening eye conditions. Technology brings about many conveniences and it continues to evolve very fast. Emerging trends are actually forcing us to rethink what might be possible in the near future. Let's take AI as an example. Um, earlier, Dr. Chu Hani actually mentioned that ChatGPT. ChatGPT is released by a Microsoft company called OpenAI in November 22. Uh, it can simulate human-like dialogue, write jokes, poetry, and even code. The answers dynamically change according to the questions asked. Uh, they are mostly accurate and even respond to follow-up questions very coherently. ChatGPT is a kind of very large-scale AI model that is trained using data from internet and books. In the past two years, uh, there has been a slew of such large-scale AI models released. 
Open AI, uh, Dell E2, for example, and Beijing Academy of Artificial Intelligence, Wudao, Wudao uh, 2.0. This creates images from text descriptions. So you can ask these platforms to produce impressionist paintings uh, of a unicorn dancing ballet. And they will also deliver astonishing results. Meta uh, released a Hokkien to English translator last year. Hokkien being a spoken language uh, actually requires different ways to engineer the kind of data that's needed for AI. But Meta showed that it can be done. And now imagine how the songs of national service are going to be transformed. So the capabilities that these AI models demonstrate from near human language understanding, creative graphic designing and translation, challenge our assumptions of what is going to be possible. But apart from AI, uh, Russian's invasion of Ukraine has also brought to the limelight how decentralized autonomous organizations or DAO can support activism. DAOs are organizations uh, whose rules are encoded as computer programs, and they usually run on blockchains. Increasingly, we are seeing examples where DAOs use the logics and the economics of blockchains to have creative fundraising and activism around causes. The Ukraine DAO, for example, uh, it raised US $7 million over five days by selling NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens, and donating the funds to nonprofits within Ukraine. Starling Labs and Hala Systems have also used blockchains and other cryptographic tools to create a chain of custody for evidence of attacks on schools in war zones. This evidence is being submitted to the International Criminal Court, and if successful, they will show how evidence collection in war zones can be done in a decentralized manner using blockchain and still be legally admissible. Technology is a global game. So many of the trends I mentioned earlier actually started overseas and they occur due to research and the needs overseas. Disruptive technologies uh, such as those mentioned stands out because the deep science behind them, coupled with the ease of use, means that the frontier capabilities can be brought at great velocity into the hands of many. And these technologies will shift the nature of our businesses. Some businesses may find their current business models upended, yet others will discover and thrive upon new business possibilities. So one thing that history has shown us is that reinventing the business models might be important, uh, especially in the digital age. So Under Armour, uh, an apparel company, noticed the digital trends in the 2010s and started to establish a digital beachhead by acquiring companies that built fitness apps. Now, on the surface, it may seem that the company is making these acquisitions to acquire technology and engineering talent. In reality, the company has a broader strategy around harnessing data for connected fitness. However, external competition from competitors like Nike are unavoidable. And to further differentiate themselves, Under Armour actually pivoted their digital strategy. And rather than go for the omni-channel approach uh, through multiple apps, they decided to simplify their strategy and diverted its resources to other areas like sportswear with IoT sensors, what we call connected wear. Data from its sportswear, uh, such as the stride length, the cadence uh, of its customers, were then collected and placed in the same data lake as data uh, on customer purchase history. By channeling all the data connect connected into a single data lake, uh, the company allowed both their customers and their designers access to data on global fitness and health trends that none of its competitors have access to. And that allowed the company to remain in step with changing trends and habits. So since embarking on this digital strategy in 2014, Under Armour has grown from US $3 billion in revenue to US $5 billion uh, in revenue. But what to change and what is needed to change? I think that's the tough part. The culture of continuous innovation is important. So to get the strategy right, uh, businesses will need to experience how technology and automation can be fully leveraged to their advantage. Now, such a change isn't going to be easy, uh, but like eagles who painfully remove their beaks and talents in order to grow new ones, change is actually essential for growth. Uh, what the government has been doing is to help through our support schemes, like the Enterprise Development Grant for Enterprise Singapore, and the Digital Leaders Program from INDA and Enterprise Singapore to hire the right expertise to help transform the businesses. For our workforce, uh, the landscape of jobs and skills needed in Singapore is going to change. 
new roles will be created. Specifically in tech, uh, I see two major areas of opportunities for individuals. First, as we dream of new users of technologies, uh, we'll need to ensure that the safety, privacy, and well-being of our users continue to be protected. And these needs will trigger a growing demand for people who work at the intersection of law, ethics, and technology. There has been growing discussions on ways to ensure that the technology we build, such as AI, is built in a way that is both green and sustainable. Uh, recently in the US, the maker of Fortnite video games, Epic Games, was actually fined 520 million, of which more than half uh, was due to the collection of personal information of children and practices that exposed these children to harassment and abuse. As another instance, uh, some AI-based facial recognition software have shown to be more accurate for certain races and worse for others. Such performance differences might not be significant when we're just trying to log into our phones, but the stakes are very much higher if the police are actually using such techniques to identify individuals, because then such technology bias can lead to systemic discrimination. This is why it is important to have a growing pool of people who understand how technology is used and also understand what the legal and ethical ramifications are. For AI, uh, IMD and PDBC are actually actively working on AI governance framework and a toolkit for businesses to be more transparent about AI. And what this means is that there will be a need for scientists who can develop the science to support testing for the governance of technology. This also means that there will be a need for professionals who can conduct testing and audit of AI systems and governance specialists who can interpret and implement such frameworks sensibly into businesses and organizations. Second area uh, is in cybersecurity, risk management, and privacy protection. Uh, these also offer other areas or opportunities. Crime is actually extending into all these new technologies, and the digital realm is also the new frontier for conflict and crime today. Case in point, even though it has been launched for barely two months, Numerous articles have pointed to ChatGPT's ability to generate malware. And despite aggressive cyber awareness campaigns, the number of ransomware cases reported in Singapore grew more than 50% from 2020 to 2021. So we need capabilities to protect our businesses and population against evolving threats. Cybersecurity, risk management, and privacy protection of professionals who can extend themselves into these new technologies will be the first movers into this space. And while new roles will be created, we can also expect that some of today's job roles will be impacted. For example, when large-scale AI models become prevalent, the way AI is practiced will change from the way it is practiced today. Rather than having each company maintain a pool of AI scientists to build their own language models, we are more likely to have engineers who can leverage on the capabilities of large-scale AI models through software interfaces, support companies going forward. And with each wave of technology changes in history, we have seen structural changes to the job landscape, and we have overcome them. In the 1990s, when computers became mainstream, the government invested in training our workforce in computing. Jobs were actually created uh, for the trained workforce as well. And this allowed us to stay competitive in the information age while preserving the space for our workforce to pursue meaningful careers. So while the tempo and lyrics have changed the current season, I think the underlying melody remains the same. Uh, we will remain committed to instilling in our workforce a sense of curiosity and the skills for versatility in order to keep pace. Earlier, Education Minister Chan Chun Sen said, uh, we must remove the artificial boundary of earning and learning in our lives. Education is a long-term endeavor and it is a necessity for us to develop confident individuals, a cohesive society and a competitive country. It is important to remain versatile, to learn and unlearn things. There are various tech skills uplifting programs uh, and schemes that are available. For example, we can uplift ourselves through initiatives such as the Tech Skills Accelerator TES TESA program. Uh, the TESA program has already trained like 180 professionals. 180,000 professionals in emerging areas such as cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and data analytics. Classes aside, uh, being strategic and deliberate in building differentiated skill sets is also going to be important. For example, what ChatGPT and DALL-E did was to put the powers of deep learning AI models into the hands of everyone. There's no need to be a software developer or AI scientist fully leveraged on the powers of AI. Even if you're not a tech person, 
you can experiment on these platforms to unlock your creative pro potential. So dare to experiment. And that can enhance creativity and unlock new ways to differentiate ourselves. Um, individuals can, can and also should stay relevant by keeping abreast of how technology is actually being used. The ATS uh, that I mentioned earlier is actually widely used to filter resumes in hiring. Now, if your resume is not formatted well for these AI tools, uh, you may not even get a chance at an interview. Workforce Singapore has published good articles on how to make your resume stand out for these tools. And I think these are all essential skills in the digital economy. Being aware and taking the initiative to manage your own career will ensure that opportunities continue to be made available to you. So global tech trends may affect the current jobs and skills landscape, but they also create new opportunities. The opportunities may seem intimidating, but opportunities in emerging areas are often where the fastest and biggest growth can be found. And uh, yeah, so I end uh, my talk now. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Um, you know, I keep thinking of Black Mirror at the beginning when you, when you, you highlighted the really significant tech developments and applications that we are seeing up to, you know, the current war the world is going through, right? The Russian-Ukraine war. So very, very Black Mirror, but it's exactly, you know, what was, what was uh, science fiction maybe 10 years ago is reality. Right. So the kind of things that you're describing may sound, I think, scary to many lay people. But I particularly like your point when you talked about, um, you know, how it is, uh, how we can actually transform or look at existing risks and threats that are posed by technology. Right. So, so to me, that is a little bit of an irony because these risks and problems that um, technology uh, posed to us, alongside the benefits that it brings to us, of course, um, also es essentially will show up the um, areas, the uncharted grounds where there are opportunities for businesses as well as individuals. I think similar to Ms. Winnie Tan, you also talked about the impact um, within your, your um, the digital, digital economy, the impact that technology poses to um, businesses and more importantly to individual workers. And um, you mentioned, you know, you talked about how education is a long-term endeavor and how what are the, um, the ways in which individuals should stay abreast of how technology works. So we will circle back to some of these points. Thank you very much. And now I'll hand over the time to Dr. Ng. Thanks, Carol. And thanks, everybody. Um, and I'm very happy to be here uh, to share some thoughts uh, I have related to the future of work, particularly in the caring sector. So let me start off by just introducing myself. I am not a geriatrician. I'm not a specialist uh, clinician. So for a long time, I felt a little bit uncomfortable when people sort of describe me as a specialist in this field and so on. Um, but what happened was many years ago as a, as a junior doctor working in the hospitals, uh, I tried to get myself you know, enrolled in some kind of specialist training programs. But uh, in some of the tutorials, I noticed the senior doctors were quizzing, you know, as junior doctors on differential diagnoses of different diseases and talking a huge crowd of us, crowding around a person who is obviously lost and scared and confused, lying on the bed. Um, and then I felt like, um, well, you know, how is he feeling, you know, among all this uh, commotion and discussion? Um, well, I didn't became, become a specialist. I just tried to be as competent as I can as a GP. So I did a lot of postings in the emergency department. And in the emergency department, apparently, um, all the nurses like to push the seniors to me because I like to talk to them. You know, Sometimes you know, they have a fracture. And the first thing I did was to give them a hug and uh, whatever. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, years later, um, uh, for some reasons, I was involved in um, a non-profit organization. So there was, uh, I was a GP, but I was uh, sort of asked to join this uh, South Foundation. Uh, we provided home care for seniors. So I, I was visiting people at their homes in Chinatown, in Bukit Merah, in Queenstown. 
So of course, um, many of the flats are one roomers, rental flats, two room, three rooms. You can feel uh, the despair of caregivers and of course, single elderly, the mate and the Samsung women and the laborers in the past that are living in Chinatown on their own, swindled by sometimes um, errant uh, co-tenant because rental flats you need to share with somebody else. And uh, so as a community doctors like that, working with nurses and social workers, frequently I visit alone. For one stage, I was a little bit confused. Am I still a doctor? So I got very, I, I was quite lost. And uh, then I talked to some other colleagues from Touch Home Care, Code 4, and they were telling me, no, you're still a doctor. But I felt myself like sometimes I have to do a little bit of counselling, sharing with them some of the newer policies of the government. I... I, there was once I remember even had to change the bed sheet because the gentleman, old, old gentleman was all alone with dementia, passing motion on the bed. So I have to like clean it. I have to mop the floor because the single elderly had a fall risk. So, but gradually over the last 20 to 30 years, I realized that actually there's no need to feel uncomfortable about this. This is the trend that um, we need to be brought broader in our understanding of um of everything and so from a doctor i started to learn about um social work about psycho-emotional health about nursing care nursing procedure how to communicate with seniors and caregivers learn different languages became quite proficient in malay in teochew in cantonese and uh, um, and then because of the work in aged care right Initially, you started off by blaming everyone, blaming the government, blaming the policies, blaming the, the, the society, blah, blah, blah. But you realize it's just a symptom of laziness. And so you start to skill yourself in, in a bit of economics, a bit of social science, a little bit of politics, a little bit of policy development, a bit of research, innovation, technology, and so on. And then you also learn many things on the ground that um, no matter how technology will develop, well, um, well, it's very hard to predict, but um, physical disability could be sort of uh, um, circumvented with robotics, exoskeleton, with uh, voice-activated uh, um, automation. But if you have dementia, it's going to be quite difficult. And um, so uh, now I have to start my talk. Now. <laughs> I structure it like this. I want to talk about the reality of aging. And then I like to talk about what people need as they age. And then I'll talk about care per se. And then I'll discuss a little bit on the skill sets I think are needed. And then the research and innovation in this particular sector. So aging, well, like uh, what we need shared about climate change is a reality of our time. Technology and technology revolution is also another reality of our time. I would argue that aging of the world is also another reality of our time that is not going to go away anytime soon. So in a uh, UN um, data that's data like 2017, um, the world, the Asia is expected to have one out of every four individuals above the age of 60. And the world is about one out of five by 2050, I mean. And we know for Singapore, by 2030, we're going to have one in four of us above the age of 65. And 2030 is like seven years. Uh, and seven years is not very long. Think about it. We are already into the fourth year of the pandemic, you know. So seven years is actually very fast. And by then, if you go to the heartlands, you go to Amokyo, you go to Yishun, you go to Bedok, you go to the hawker centers, the marketplaces, there'll be very few people, either mates or seniors. And then you'll be all like, like that. And But then again, there are also very promising data to show that even though we are aging, many of us will be healthily aged. So something that I got, um, which was a little bit dated, 2017, our healthy life expectancy has increased, you know, from 68 to 75 over a span about uh, from 1990 to 2017, so it's 27 years, so increase our healthy life expectancy by um, about eight years, you know, seven to eight years. However, at the same time, our life expectancy has also increased 
you know, from uh, 1990, it was uh, 75, and 2017 is, is about 85. So you can see, even as we become healthier for longer, the period of us spent with less than optimal health, maybe with a little bit of disability, is still around 10 years. So even improvement in health sciences hasn't quite increased the health healthy life expectancy. It has increased healthy life expectancy, but it also increased the length of life at the same time. And if anything to go by during the parliamentary debate, when cash life was um, debated, um, I heard the minister talking about four of four out of ten of us, the median, sorry, the median duration of severe disability where you need elder shield or casual life funding. That's three out of six activities of daily living when you need help. It's four years. Imagine that you'll be wheelchair bound, maybe having dementia for four years. So despite all the you know the 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 random innovations that we have come so far in you know and at the same time there are many records the one that i have is also a bit old 2019 the number of people living alone has increased from 6.2 percent to 7.3 even though absolutely it's not a lot but if you look at the jump it's by increased by nearly 20 percent people will be living alone. And, and that was 2019. Imagine how is it now? How many people are living alone? And more than this, more be, a lot of people are elderly couple living together. I've got friends working, I mean, working as grassroots uh, volunteers. They go around with the members of parliament visiting door to door. In the, in the HDB heartlands, if you actually visit all of them, you see a lot of seniors there. And not just HDB heartlands, private housing. A lot of big houses are occupied by two seniors and one of them have dementia. You know, it's very, it's, it's going to be quite common. And, and we all know, we all experience this among our friends, even ourselves. We find that people delay their marriage, you know, even not getting married. Even if they get married, they don't have kids. Even if they have kids, they only have one or two. And even if they got more, many of them are, you know, as they grow older and older because of, technology revolution, climate change, globalization. Our offsprings are all over the world. And, and I'm caring for a lot of seniors now. Their children are communicating with me by WhatsApp and by Zoom because they're living in Australia or in America. So this is going to be like the trend. So this is the population aging. So with this shrinking of the, the changing of the social structure, smaller families, longer life expectancy, despite longer healthy life expectancy, the, the period where we have to live with relative disability and frailty is also still there. And what will happen is that there's an increased risk of social isolation. There's an increased risk of, um, of uh, mental health issues. And uh, all the chronic illnesses are there because we are older. So what do people need when they grow older? So of course you can ask yourself because you're also aging. But let's... Um, I, I like a document from WHO that was dated like 2012 and later it was uh, up to, updated by International Longevity Centre Brazil that there are four pillars for all of us to lead an active ageing life. That's security, health, or you can put health first, health, security, social participation, and lifelong learning. And for me, in my experience, I'll add a fifth one. I call it resilience. Resilience some people call it spiritual dimension, but resilience is really a combination of how do you manage stress, your ability to manage stress, as well as your a worldview that is sustainable and that you have you have um, very deep trust in. Okay, so these five pillars I think are really important. And for these five pillars, it's not just a matter of doctors, nurses, social workers, counselors. The whole society need to come together to support this quality of life. You need to have a vibrant economy. You need to have very innovative and accessible health and social sector services. You need to have a very well-designed physical environment as well as well-designed interfaces. Now we talk about technology. So you need to have very age-friendly technology access. And you need to have very conducive societal culture. You know, people are inclusive, respect seniors, not just focus on children, you know, and then you need to have 
very empowered individuals. Of course, good genes is really important, but there's also epigenetics, the personal factors. And behavior, people have behavior that's conducive to, to health, wealth, relationship, and lifelong learning. So all these, and we need to have gender lens, we need to have cultural lens, and so on. So these are the things based on the active aging framework from World Health Organization. And coming more microscopically, we look at a person who needs care. So if, if you live longer, even with the latest innovations from NUS and other places where you can actually find the, the drug and the antibodies that can kill our senescent cells, that can extend your, your uh, um, telomeres you know, to live longer. But still, even if you expand your lifespan by 50%, say you live to 150 years, nobody wants the prospect of dropping dead. So all of us will try to live longer and you will not be able to, what I suspect, we will not be able to stave off frailty for too long. So we'll have to have disability. So when there's disability, what do you need the most? Of course, inner resilience and external help. And the most important external help is caregiving, especially when you can no longer handle your own basic activities of daily living. So caregiving, of course, we depend on our family, but with the shrinking family sizes, you can't avoid, you know, contracting out to somebody else. Nowadays, we depend a lot on mates. Recently, I was at a friend's funeral and then we were a friend's father's wake and then we were talking about how a lot of people, seniors and families, they are hanging around wakes and funerals looking at helpers who now suddenly do not need to care for anyone so that they can catch and transfer the contract to themselves. So actually, hiring helpers is not going to be easy sooner or later. And especially now I'm also helping a developmental organization in some economies like Indonesia, Mongolia. You can see that the aging population and the urban rural trans rural urban migration is also very important. It's also quite pressing. They need young, healthy individuals for themselves. So in the future, these migrant helpers, well, I think Singapore still have a very good attractiveness for migrant workers, but we may not be able to rely on this for too long because our Southeast Asian countries also need younger people for themselves. Asia is also developing very fast. So caregiving, how do you, how do you know caregiving? Caregiving is not just about transferring, changing diapers. Those, of course, are really, really necessary, hard to replace by robots. But you also need the learning around managing care. You need to know how to navigate the systems, how to get the best deal, how to how to know about health monitoring, know about dementia, know about cancer care, palliative care. So the, the second last point is about skill set. So we need a lot of skills in caregiving, in direct basic activities of daily living support, health monitoring, nursing, and all the therapy exercise and so on. And all these need to be sort of shifted to be more catered to an aging population. But more than that, uh, it's about stress management, about organizing the social resources so that so that the social determinants of health can be better managed because social connectedness is so important. And finally, on research and innovation, with all this, you know, aging population comes with a lot of opportunities for innovation. Off the cuff, I can think of life sciences. There's so many things we can do. If we can extend lifespan, reduce diseases, we can we actually can reduce a lot of unnecessary Alzheimer's disease, cancer, and so on, and we can live a bit longer. But I'm just thinking that you probably can't, you, I, I don't think immortality is still possible yet. The second thing is about implementation science. You need to apply all this into human. Human behaviors are unpredictable, and of course, AI can help. But to AI, with AI, you need very robust data. So currently, I'm, I'm an interi fellow for Singapore. This is a standardization of data that is very badly needed. I mean, Winnie was talking about this. In aged care, all the more, we need standardization of data. Otherwise, you do not know what is the right cost, right amount of service. This is customization, right amount of care. And so you need a lot of research in implementation science and translating this into policies. So in summary, aging like climate change and technology is a modern day reality. Aging for an individual comes with existence. We cannot escape it. With aging, we will need to become frail. And aging affects all people and there's op opportunities for all, not just the direct caregivers, but all the PMETs. They have to deal with aging themselves and all the sectors of the economy need to transform itself to have an aging literacy, just like green literacy, technology literacy. 
aging literacy like caregiving becomes going to be a norm how can workplace be conducive for caregivers and um, I think that's the main point I like to make so there's a huge potential for skill sets employment innovation thank you Dr Ng thank you for you know um, elucid elucidating to us very clearly the third and pressing reality right so we have the green reality, the digital reality, and the aging reality. And you um, ended uh, your presentation, you're talking about the different types of skill sets that you think are required um, in caregiving. So thank you to all three panelists uh, for um, sharing with us your thoughts. And I think there are several common themes that straddle um, your three, uh, three sets of remarks, right? Clearly, one being the role of technology, um, two being the role of different stakeholders. You know, I think each of you have in your own way proffered um, certain suggestions for how different stakeholders can work together. And three, I also picked up this thing about inclusiveness, right? Leaving no one behind. Um, and um, so, so these are certainly some things that we, we will need to um, talk about. So perhaps just uh, as moderator, let me ask the first question um, to all of you. So, circling back to Minister Chan's um, keynote speech today, he spoke about the five strategic or key thrusts that are required of the Singapore education system. And one of the five key shifts is to you know, define success right, beyond the first 15 years in school to the next 50 years after that. And one key component uh, for this shift is to encourage and instill continuous learning at the individual level. So to all three of you, what do you think, um, how do you think we can encourage uh, Singaporeans to have the mindset for lifelong learning so that they can thrive in uh, new jobs or even yet to be created one? And forgive me for being a bit greedy because all of you, you know, in your own ways, you talked about the need to be resilient nimble, flexible. So not only do we want people to keep learning new skills, acquire more knowledge to apply, say, adjacent skills, for instance, but we're talking about flexibility, which implies, you know, being on a constant lookout for um, new knowledge or skills to acquire. So it seems like a huge ask of time-starved um, Singaporeans of different ages, even as students and young workers. So your thoughts on how can we nurture and encourage this black mindset for lifelong learning? Uh, who would like to go first? Uh, maybe I can take a step at it. Um, and I'm actually going to say something that is completely unrelated to all the three topics that we've covered today. I, I, I think the, the luxury of being able to uh, take to do a, a, a job that you actually uh, want to do, it is actually probably the most powerful um, driver for you to want to learn, for you to want to um, do well and, and pivot and excel. Um, but in a way, if you didn't have the luxury of that, um, the job that meets the requirements that checks the boxes, say for economic contribution, for bringing the, the salary home, for, for helping you play your role as a breadwinner, that too, you know, um, and that would that would also work in, in, in that sense. So I think what happens is in, in that larger environment of, of creating um, um, autonomy and, 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 and being able to let people have the flexibility to do what they want to do, or, or at least um, having um, a, a fair and a fair and, and, and adequate uh, pay structure and, and reward and remuneration and protecting the rights of not just executives, but also workers. I, I think that would be uh, hugely important in, in sort of like a large macro perspective. I mean, obviously the attitude of individuals and all of that, that that's hugely important. Um, um, being able to find um, um, a vocation, that is not an easy one. But I think um, the other practical aspects of making sure that um, um, the job helps tick the boxes and, and therefore someone is willing to do that and therefore excel and want to excel. Uh, I think that is something that's very practicable. Maybe I can also contribute that to this point. Um, if you were to, uh, well, my own experience, taking care of seniors, 
those who are curious and want to learn are people who are generally confident. Um, generally, the basic needs like security is already satisfied, health is satisfied, relationships is warm and there. So, um, so when a person has got very strong sense of well-being and mental health, they will want to learn more because, um, well, arguably, uh, learning and growing is like human uh, nature, right? So, um, so in order to encourage people to learn, I think one of the important things is um, focus on this psychosocial dimension of health. The other thing I like to talk about is the phenomenon that we observe during the pandemic. Because of need, there is a learning. You know, for a long time, people put off a lot of seniors. I'm talking about seniors here. They put off um, learning how to use uh, you know, QR code, WhatsApp, WeChat, and so on. But because of the pandemic, they started to, to learn many things. CDC vouchers, for example, you know, um, and then the transaction over the bank. Now, I'm frequently... Uh, my conversation with my mom is usually around <laughs> technology, you know, how to learn this and that. So people learn when there's a need. So mental well-being and then create the awareness that there's a need to learn. Okay, so Winnie, you spoke about um, looking into the structural conditions to incentivize learning, upskilling, etc. Right. And Dr. Ng, you just highlighted uh, the certain meeting certain so psychosocial needs to encourage learning. Um, over to you, Dr. Ng. Do you have any thoughts on how we can nurture this mindset among, mindset among Singapore workers on learning continuously? Hmm. So I think uh, one thing is uh, to really look at this from a growth mindset. So I think the only thing that will be constant going forward will be that there will be quite a bit of change. Uh, and the question will be, uh, then how do we actually uh, adapt to change? And learning is a large part of it. I think the question sometimes also is, uh, how do we actually identify what to learn? Because it does seem like there are a lot of things that are changing at the same time. Um, so there will also need to be a focus. And for that, I would say, uh, maybe go with what is an adjacent skill set as well as uh, what is an area of interest. And after the learning, I think um, learning sometimes isn't just about reading things on the internet or going for a class. It is also about applying. Uh, and some of it uh, will actually have to happen at the job that you're currently working on. Raise your hands, uh, ask for some of the opportunities with the new skill sets uh, to tackle on projects uh, that are uh, in the area of interest or in the area that you're learning. And I think then that will help to kind of apply what has been learned and that can help with some of the internalization. But taking a step back, I, I do also uh, very much uh, agree with what uh, Dr. Ng has said. I think uh, the capacity for learning uh, a lot of times comes when uh, some of the, a, a lot of the basic needs are actually met. I mean, I, if I look across my own journey and I look at the journey, uh, career journey of my friends, I think there'll be times uh, within your own career where maybe other priorities uh, may dominate and you may not be able to find the same capacity for learning. But that does not mean that just because you didn't find the capacity for learning at every single point of uh, your career journey, that you cannot then pick up on uh, the new things that comes when you are ready for it. So I think uh, both of these are actually very important. You, you really covered uh, different grounds, right, on your recommendations from the structural conditions to the social cycle um, dimensions to um, Dr. Ong. You just essentially identified very clear, um, well, in a way, bite-sized strategies that people can adopt to identify what to learn at uh, different times of their lives, right? So um, thank you very much for that. I'm now turning to a set of questions that are posed by um, our audience online. Um, and these are questions are quite uh, highly voted. Uh, among the three of you, like what I mentioned earlier, technology is a common thread that ran through um, your provocations. So here's a question on technology uh, framed from the angle of disruptive technology. So uh, Leon Lin and also Katrina Tan got these questions, right? Uh, how can the government and the private sector work together to use disruptive technology to help the average Singaporean 
find a job or identify new areas for learning. So this is very, I think, tactical, um, very practical, but clearly a key concern, um, you know, that's felt by Singaporeans from all walks of life, right? So maybe we will take a step at that first. Your thoughts, anyone? Uh, I can take a step at it first. Sure. Um, so I think when it comes to some of this disruptive technology, uh, one of the things is that uh, for the Singaporeans that are still in school, uh, one way is to be able to incorporate some of these uh, disruptive technologies, uh, to be able to keep abreast of some of these technologies, uh, even for our students that are in school. And it doesn't have to be uh, a big bang. It can be something that's bite-sized, uh, just to get uh, the students' hands dirty, uh, to understand what the technology can actually mean for themselves, to build differentiators for themselves. Uh, the other part is that there will be another segment uh, of our population of the individuals who are actually already working. And the question then is, uh, how do we actually help uh, some of these uh, Singaporeans so, uh, to be able to upskill or to be able to find jobs uh, in the new landscape, right? And I think there are various ways in which we can go about doing it. Uh, one is, uh, I think the government can work together with trade associations and chambers to identify what are the jobs and the skills that are needed. <clears throat> and some of this can be done ahead of time, uh, for example, through the job transformation maps. And this can actually uh, help to kind of bring awareness on what are some of the skills and the know-how that will be important and what are some of the growth industries uh, that can be identified ahead of time. But for the individuals, I think uh, it's also important to come with that uh, mindset that uh, we don't need to differentiate ourselves, right? And sometimes uh, it isn't just about going for the what the classes can teach or what some of these job transformation maps are. It is about how those maps actually can apply to what skill sets and domain expertise we actually already have. So it's about differentiating. Um, and I think in regards to this, uh, there are ways to look at experimenting with some of these technologies to look at applying some of these technologies together with our domain expertise and to see what are like the productivity gains or what are some of the new ideas that can actually spark uh, from it. So I think if we can have that balance of individuals, of the trade associations and the government coming together, as well as the schools, then I think that would be a very powerful combination. Mm. I think what you just said echoed what was communicated in this morning's keynote. Uh, one of the key strategic trusts is to move from um, the approach that upskilling and training is MOE's effort to a whole of society effort, right? Not just what government can do, what people can do, but also industry partners. Uh, and um, you mentioned the industry roadmaps as well. And, and to be very honest, all these programs and all these publications have uh, been at work and have been out in the public domain for quite many years. So maybe just a quick follow on that. Do you think um, there could be more that can be done in terms of the last mile delivery or communication of some of these programs and initiatives? So the fact is they are there, but people don't yes. seem to know. Yes, uh, this I agree. I think um, there are um, the reach out using the, all these maps uh, through the trade association and chambers, I think there has been a certain segment of the population that has been has been reached. Uh, we started some of this uh, drop transformation map uh, last year. Um, so we have uh, about one year of experience. I think more can be done uh, to make sure that we reach out to a broader segment and perhaps uh, to some of these companies as well to let them actually see uh, what are some of the skill sets uh, that will be important in the future. And I do think that maybe by co-opting some of these companies, uh, there can be value in it as well, because then the companies can have a look ahead to see what are some of the transformation or some of the impact to the businesses. And if they can uh, prepare for this as well, uh, to create opportunities within the organizations for some of these new roles, uh, new exploration, and co-opt their, uh, co their employees into it, then I think that will be a case where both the employer as well as the employee are both learning at the same time. And that can be synergistic in many ways. Thank you so much, Dr. Ong. Um, Dr. Ong or Winnie, do you have any uh, comments to add to this? If not, I'll move on to the next question. 
Um, for yes. me, I'd just like to add that, uh, well, uh, learning, people learn when they feel there's a need. And when there's a need arise, when they actively participate in the community and the society. Either so, one of the best way I find is um is to work if we are gainfully employed or we are actually uh, productively like um uh, engaged in uh, value creation. The need requires us to keep learning new things, not just technology, but many other aspects of uh, interaction and product providing value. And apart from that, it's um well community engagement, so participating in social activities. So. For a lot of people, once they retire, sometimes they get marginalized and disconnected, and that's when they no longer can connect. And all the more they don't 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 see the need to learn, and then they'll just accept whatever reality there, there is, and then uh, they miss out a lot of opportunities for growth and development, which they will come to appreciate. So, if we could put in effort to have lifelong work, lifelong participation, community connectedness, uh, make everything. Um, accessible um, and then uh, um, you know uh, I think we would be able to sort of uh, be very positive about aging and creating opportunities for people to keep learning and contributing and then they'll have a very very fun and meaningful life I think yeah okay thank you Dr. Um, um... Uh, Winnie, can, can I have something to add? Can I just add a quick comment? I think um, the frame of the question was about how businesses and, and governments can work together. So I always felt that um, obviously businesses, they are sort of at the front line. Um, you are seeing the customer demands, you're seeing the operational changes, you're seeing the trends that happens. And I think this collaboration is actually really important because I I've, I've, I sound like a broken record, but I've spoken about the importance of policy changes at the right pace, at the right time, to, to scale behavior changes and, 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 and happening fast enough. So I think what happens is you sort of need that frontline intel um, so that you can synchronize it with a larger scale um, government spending policies, etc. So So this in a timely manner and clearly being able to work collaboratively with, with a flexible approach. I think that's that's hugely important, um, particularly for disruptive technologies, because we're not just talking about jobs that get automated and jobs that fall away. There is also the jobs that have yet to be created, you know, things that we never really quite thought about, right? Um, but I also need to think about the nature of the jobs in the sense of like the gig economy. I mean, we, we never quite thought about that, but but I think that's a huge change for, for my younger cousins, nieces, and nephews. Um, they don't have a traditional view of um, working in a large company and, and, you know, or working with a company for five years and, and that's, that's a bit long, you know, or, or thinking about protection for them because then these policies will have different spillover effects because a gig economy worker would have different protection, social benefits, etc. So I think it's about getting also a different, the, the frontline sort of business view with the policymakers and also within the policymaking frame, the different departments or agencies that need to think about the, the, the impact. Um, so I think that's really where I feel would be the value of that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so maybe just a quick follow on that uh, a question by Sean, which has also garnered uh, quite many votes. Um, I think uh, among the three of you talk about helping people recognize the need, right? Help them identify which are the areas of need. As long as they see the need for a particular skill, they are. Uh, they might be more encouraged or motivated to pick it up. Uh, at school, you know, Dr. Ong, we talk about what can be done at the school level to increase awareness among students and also for those who are already working, you know, partnership between government and trade associations, etc., to communicate, right, roadmaps, uh, um, um, employment journeys for people and the corresponding skills that they need to um, um, acquire. But the fact remains is that sometimes despite the knowledge, that people might have on the skills that they have to acquire, there could be this sense of um, being overwhelmed um, by the sure rapid changes that all of you talked about, right? So Timothy's question is, he thinks that it takes a lot more for workers to upskill or reskill. Um, so what are your thoughts on helping workers overcome that time lag, right? And that the feeling that they are forever playing catch up. So maybe just a quick comment on that because we have some other questions that I would really hope to get around to. Anyone? We need coaches, we need gurus. Coaches and gurus, okay. Yeah. 
life transitions. I think in the future, this is going to be quite important for because these are basic skills. I think Minister Chan mentioned about it, how to stay con curious, how to continue to have the skills to learn new things and how to have the inner resilience to confront all these changes and still feeling confident about it and knowing that we are on the right track and everything is meaningful. So all this is not, it's not hard um, knowledge and skills. It's a lot of uh, personal character, um, personality, um, and also uh, whether you, you know, the Chinese term is called gui ren, whether you have a mentor or a coach. And uh, it cannot be just for the PMETs. It has to also be for the common men and women, you know, all of us. We all need someone to sort of, like my mom, you know, she's an auntie. She has all these mentors who are fellow aunties to teach her that you need to get this app. You need to ask your son about this. So it's this kind of mentors and coaches in the community. We, I think it's going to be a huge need, a, a coach for aging, a coach for transitions. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I did not admit something at the beginning. I am a greedy moderator, okay? Meaning I really try to cover as much as I can. And I'm just looking at the questions that's flooding, you know, this other device that I'm looking at. And there's just so many, right? So this is what I'm going to do. Um, there is a specific question for Dr. Um, there's also a specific question for um, uh, Winnie. So let me read up those out to you and you can think about it first. And then I have a question that any of you can take. Okay. So um, from uh, my fellow colleague, um, senior research fellow, Christopher G from IPS, his question to Dr. Ng is, in your view, do we properly price goods and services in the care economy? If not, how will we ever make a successful transition to a super aged society? What do we, what do you recommend we do? Okay, think about it. Okay, and then um, to Winnie. Okay, I'm looking at this question, Winnie on carbon emissions. Right, given that Singapore. Okay, this is from Kirana. Prahasanti. Given that Singapore does not play a large part in total global carbon emissions, how do you think we can widen our impact, such as by collaborating with regional partners? So think about this, Winnie. So this other question um, uh, is actually made up of a few contributions by a few people. There seems to be a fair bit of concern between the Gulf of technology and skills acquisition and um, people who might be left behind. So for example, we need towards the end, you know, I hear you loud and clear when you say that no one can be left behind, right? We need to think about everybody and we need to think about um, everyday jobs, not just certain um, high level jobs, for instance, right? So, um, and there's, there's, there's some questions relating to this. Uh, so for example, um, disruptive technology so far seems to be worsening existing inequalities, right? Um, do you even agree with this assessment and uh, how can we or different, how can different stakeholders work together to mitigate this impact? So um, I'm greedy, but I'm also quite egalitarian. So feel free, uh, anyone jump in to answer any bit of the questions that I have posed to you as a collective or individually. Um, since you um, you you, um, you asked uh, Christopher's question for some chance, talk about that. Um, well, recently I was uh, in Bangkok uh, visiting a retirement village. It's obviously for the wealthy, but Bangkok, Thailand, the the the, the price of everything is of course not as high as in Singapore, but still, the skilled nursing facilities is quoted to me at eight thousand US dollars per person per month, eight thousand US dollars. And 2015, I visited a nursing care, nursing home in Kyoto. It was priced at 10,000 US dollars per person per month. And in Singapore, I understand it is priced at 3,500. That was also a few years, Singapore dollars per person per month. Why is Singapore so cheap? So, um, so Christopher's question is, is, is really an illustration. Are we pricing it low? But where did this low cost come from? So I work in some nursing homes as well. And uh, most of the the staffs are from Philippines, from uh, Myanmar, from, from India. Perhaps it's because of the migrant workers. But with the reason we all know about this, you know, there's a huge uh, outflow of, um, there's a lot of competition for these skilled workers. Um, 
semi-skilled workers, aged care workers. So many of the, the hospitals in private, uh, their wards are closed because there are not enough nurses to go about. So are we? how long can we afford to pay people at a low price? So but what is the real cost? I'm, I'm just wondering whether is it ever possible to calculate because there is also cultural dimension. A lot of caregiving is borne by informal caregivers, the family members, the daughters, the daughter-in-law, those who are not working. So how do we price that in? So of course, you can actually price that with the kind of cost. But how do you translate that into policy? policy? That's why I talk about the importance of standardizing data, importance of standardizing assessment, especially in terms of long-term care. That's why I, I talk about interi all the time. So, so with that, perhaps we can come to find out what's the real cost of care for a disabled person. Um, maybe uh, Winnie, to you on for the question on carbon admission, and then perhaps Dr. Ong, uh, not suggesting that you speak on behalf of all the panelists, but perhaps you can uh, uh, take a step at a question on minimizing um, inequality and disparity. Sure. Okay, so, so a quick one on the carbon emissions. So I think Singapore is a very unique economy. I mean, we are highly export-oriented, but we are highly import-dependent from a lifestyle and survival perspective. So um, while our population is really small, um, our land mass is really, really small, uh, uh, we do have a fairly significant uh, um, footprint in that sense, in, in that perspective. Uh, petrochemical sector uh, exports is, is still one of the biggest ones, our reliance on fossil fuels, etc. cetera. Um, but I think what's really also important is um, Singapore's role in how we contribute to the solution. And I think um, um, Singapore sort of punches, uh, and, and Singaporean, I'm very proud of it, we, we punch above our weight in the way we contribute to the conversations and COP, um, in sort of doubling up uh, our commitments to, to go for net zero by 2050 or a time identifiable at the last recent COP. So I think these are important things because Singapore also has as itself a very open economy, um, a very educated uh, workforce, and we have also a very powerful regional uh, financial hub. And we spoke about technology, we spoke about the role of financing, and these are some of the key levers where we can actually play a very meaningful part. While we may not be the largest country, we may not have the biggest uh, landmass or population, but I think these intellectual uh, property or, or, or assets that we have built um, allows us uh, to do a lot more than we are actually set up for. And I think what's also very important is thinking about our export-oriented economy and our sort of import-dependent lifestyles. Um, um, when certain regions are thinking about imposing carbon tax when they import things and then we are a very export-oriented economy, we will have to make sure that we check the boxes for the sustainability checklist or the carbon emissions checklist, if you like, um, when we actually uh, look at how our export economy is going to develop. It means that it's not just a cost of manufacturing, it's not a cost of intellectual property, but it's also the cost of, say, carbon tax, of, of subsidies, uh, tariffs, etc. So I think this is why it's very important to us, not just from a physical climate perspective, but from a, a, a economy perspective perspective, how we build our costs and also thinking about we, we need everything for our daily lives from the water to fruits to, to food and, and eggs and etc. So thinking about this in both an export-oriented economy and an import-dependent uh, lifestyle, I think this is where it's very important and I think we should definitely continue developing um, um, our, our role and be able to contribute to that. And, and I think generally um, in Asia, the electrification or the change or transition of our energy usage, um, that is one of the biggest uh, ways that we can contribute. Um, one, of, one of the biggest things I always love to emphasize is, while Asia has uh, most of the biggest problems, we are also home to most of the fastest growing economies in the world. And as a Singapore, as Singapore as a regional uh, financial hub, we definitely would be able to channel capital, investments, um, um, sort of new inventions, technologies, uh, in order to catalyze those change. And I think this is a position that we should always um, uh, make sure that we, we keep. Thank you, Winnie. And Dr. Ong? Yeah, so I think uh, the question was about whether technology um, uh, is perpetuating existing inequalities, right? And what, what is it that we can do to build better technologies? So I, I just want to say I share the same aspirations that are one technology that can do better than what it's actually doing now. Uh, and I think policymakers worldwide uh, in multiple countries across multiple regions are having the same concerns. 
today, a lot of the technology that we see, uh, it prioritizes speed, it prioritizes performance. But some of the other considerations, sustainability, fairness, uh, what it actually means for uh, things like safety, and is there even transparency in how technology is actually built mm -hmm. or how it actually makes decisions, right? So I think some of these uh, considerations over time will need to be built into the technology. The question then is, how do we actually incentivize the makers of the technology to actually incorporate some of these uh, considerations? The, so to me, I think part of the question is really about uh, how do we actually get to the state where we can actually move, a ne move the needle and make the difference. And there are a lot of things that actually needs to change. Procurement practices needs to change. So the people buying the technology and serving out the technology needs to think about how they can actually incorporate some of these requirements. How do they actually ensure that uh, the technology they buy and the technology they use is fair, for example, or is green. Um, it also means that uh, the science behind a lot of this, uh, just now I think both Winnie as well as Dr. Ng have mentioned that there's a need for things like data standardization. Uh, there is a need for a common set of standards so that you can actually compare. Some of those sciences uh, needs to be present and today they are not present. Uh, and so there is actually a lot of work that I think uh, researchers can do to look at how to actually give visibility as well as give uh, repeated measurements, re repeatable measurements, right, to a lot of these uh, emerging areas in which we want companies to balance performance, to balance speed, uh, together with uh, sustainability goals, uh, together with uh, fairness goals, and so on. And last but not least, I think the way we look at corporate governance also needs to change. Uh, some of the directions in which uh, how we actually decide what gets built, what gets put into the roadmap, what actually is important for the companies uh, comes from uh, corporate governance kind of practices, uh, whether that is from the board or whether that is from management, uh, actually putting that as uh, an important requirement uh, for the teams, right? And the question then is, uh, what are the right carrots and sticks such that we can actually instill the changes needed in uh, corporate governance so that all of these considerations then becomes important uh, to the company? Uh, frankly, at this moment, I feel that uh, regulations can only do so much. And when we talk about regulations, it's, a, it's actually a very big stick. And we do need to balance uh, the need for regulations with the need for innovation. Right. Uh, so the question I think is still fairly op uh, open. I honestly don't have the answer. Uh, but I think these are these are very important. I think these three factors uh, do need to shift in order for us to actually be able to see a difference. Thank you, Dr. Ong. I, I do think that, that you do have the answer somewhere if we listen hard enough, right? I mean, we, we talked about, I think Timothy um, and sub several members of the audience highlighted the marginalization of technology, the threats of how technology can ex actually exacerbate existing inequalities and further alienate marginalized societies. And these are some of the things that you pointed out. And by talking about what can be done, you are actually highlighting the gaps in existing skills that can be plucked. Right? Occupations that lie in the intersection of, say, ethics and technology development, for instance. So I think there are some things we can take away from what you have just said. So we have actually come to the last minute of the session. I do believe, especially looking at some of the questions that we did not manage to get around to, that we can easily go on for another 30 minutes, but I'm not going to subject everybody to this. So just final question, okay? Um, we have spoken a lot about what employees need to do, right? Uh, for example, the mindset they need to hone, etc. Final question for all of you, what about employers? What employers do to help workers thrive in a new economy? It's just one action point each. I know this is not the final wrap-up question I, I threw all of you, but I really thought we haven't addressed this. Would anyone like to go first? Um, 20 seconds answer. Principles, three. Inclusiveness, sustainability, equitability. 
Okay, thank you for businesses. Three principles to think about to help their employees thrive. Any, uh, um, Winnie? Um, I think they should just think about it as part of their long term strategy. Uh, mm -hmm. and it is not it is not something nice to do. It is it's actually something that would defend their own sustainable development. So I think it's that frame of mind that businesses should go in with. Fantastic. So three principles. Think long term. And over to you, Doctor Ong. Yeah. Um. So I think uh one thing businesses can do is to embrace change and to look at how their strategy uh, should actually allow them to be nimble and to embrace that change, the changes that will come. Uh, the second part about it is that even as it's devising a strategy uh, for change, uh, the question is how do they actually create the opportunities for the employees to actually come along with them uh, to learn together with the business. Uh, so these two points. Okay, so also attitude amongst the employers. Thank you so much. I think among the three of you, you, you have covered such a broad scope of very, very important provocations. So unfortunately, we have come to the end of this panel. You know, um, again, I would like to thank uh, Winnie, Dr. Ong, Dr. Ng for sharing your insights and being so accommodating to me. Uh, and to everyone who joined us online, uh, a very big thank you to for being such an engaging audience. So the video for this panel will be available on this online platform for about two weeks if you would like to watch it again. Now, our next panel is on identifying and addressing longer term work trends and the role of the state and educational institutions. That will start at 2 p.m. Join us then. So um, thank you, everyone. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the IPS Singapore Perspectives Conference on Work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.